Welcome, welcome to another Clock Tower. Uh, in the Clock Tower, this is uh, Pastor Chris Byers of St. John's Lutheran Church in beautiful Jilt, Wisconsin. And thankfully it is warming up here and we just need to be praying for those in climates that are feeling cold that they're not used to feeling. Uh, this is a, it's a wonderful time though to come together here as uh, we come together as a church and we study uh, what it is that uh, we studied in Sunday school this Sunday. We continue on with the Seed Bible Study through Sola Publishing. Uh, you can find them on solishpublishing.com, uh, and you can uh, look on there, and we have some great, good Lutheran resources available there uh, for those of you Lutheran Christians that would like even more. There's some great books I'd also uh, urge you. You can go look there and some other good pub- publications that are put together Uh for, for us, those of us confessional Lutherans. Um, one of the things that we're continuing on in this study is we're in Unit A3, Lesson 2. Uh, Jesus Calls Matthew is the title of this. Uh, we go through with that here. You can download. Uh, the, um, the link is available. If you don't have the lesson, you can always download it uh, and be able to review it there um, if you haven't gotten it already. And that way you can follow along with the study. I'm going to actually go to my other screen here as we uh, and uh, go with the prayer that I have as I put the study up here for that too so we can go along uh, here as I keep thinking of ways to help make this a little bit different and uh, keep moving on, uh, helping keep us on the same page, so to speak. Uh, let us pray together uh, the prayer that you'll find right at the top there. Uh, Loving Lord, you have called us to be your disciples and to follow you wherever you go. We are grateful for your mercy toward us. When we sin and fall short of your holy will, and you give us the chance to begin anew, give us the honesty to confess our failures and turn to you in repentance. Help us in our daily lives to lean on you and not on ourselves. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. The introduction we have here, it says, When Jesus began his public ministry, he chose disciples to accompany him and learn from him. Uh, the, uh, the people he chose were not people, uh, not what people would expect. In the case of Matthew, sometimes called Levi, his choice of a sinful tax collector became a source of suspicion and criticism among upstanding, law-abiding folk. One thing that we understand about when we think about... Uh, what it is that um, Jesus is doing in this ministry is we have to realize that he is giving us uh, an insight, helping us understand what it is that God desires of his people. So uh, he wants us to constantly be uh, realizing that as the followers that he chose us, because that's what a disciple means, or actually follower or student actually would be a better definition, uh, learning his discipline, uh, his understanding of the faith as he, as God was working through them to teach. Now, I want us to open up Matthew uh, 9, uh, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. I'm going to go to my Logos screen so that way we can read together what that says. Um, and but it's always good to have your Bible uh, available to be able to follow along uh, and, uh, and, and just open that up. Now, the version I use, the English Standard Version, you may have a different version out there. Uh, the reality is any Bible you read is a good Bible, uh, as one of my professors once said. Um, so just uh, be in your Bible, follow along, and you can always take notes in your Bible, also take notes on the sheet. If you have any comments or anything like that you'd like to share, feel free uh, to post that on the comments area if, you have a, if you're able to do that easily. I know if you're watching through a smart television, that's not usually available, or if you're watching through Roku. But if you're on a tablet and you're not on the full screen, you'll usually see uh, the comments area, which you can comment on underneath there. Excuse me, need to get a drink, some coffee there for myself. Uh, make it feel real authentic for everybody else, too. 
Um, but you know, it's uh, got to have my coffee. I am a good Lutheran that way, I guess. Um, so let us move on here. I'm going to make that transition over uh, to my Lagos here for you. There we go. Uh, you should see that here. Uh, and we are going to read 9 through 13. I just highlighted. Um, so I will put that there. It highlights there. And we go. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And Jesus reclined at table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were, recli and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So we have this question here that comes on to our Adobe that goes to that, our, our section here on the worksheet. Uh, says, on reading these verses, what are some of your initial impressions and questions? What stands out to you? Well, when we were talking about this in class, uh, there was a lot of, there was some discussion on this. Uh, you know, he just left his things. Um, he... Uh, and then, of course, there were those. Oh, one of the things that was brought up is just how much the Pharisees were watching him. And uh, the fact that Jesus really didn't care. Uh, that's a good point. You know, he wasn't worried about what the world leaders thought of him. He was more worried about teaching the word, teaching people, lifting people up in faith. He came in and he actually really called this out, if you think about it. He said he didn't come for those that were already healed, right? That were feeling they were self-righteous. I mean, if you are self-righteous, if you think you can do it on your own, you really don't need God, do you? You can do it all on your own. You're fine. I mean, the reality, we know that nobody is able to. But sometimes people like to think and act as if they are the ones in control. But see, Jesus was uh, really, in, early on, even in his ministry, was challenging that assumption by so many. Um, that were thinking that they were fine on their own, they were good on their own, and uh, that struggle that we we face. I mean, uh, I think we all know self righteous people. We know them in the church. We know them outside of the church. People think that they are really really good, and they don't need God. Some of them, or some just because they go to church, by that matter, think they're really good. I mean, I know in ministry myself. Uh, that's something that uh, it just uh, never, well, it surprised me at first, but it doesn't anymore. Uh, how many people actually forget, forget that we are all sinners. As Christians, that's just a f fact of who we are. Uh, there is no way to get around that. And better, you know, better to lay, realize that in our own living, in our own lives, because there's some humility in realizing your sin, right? Um, that uh, we are all sinners. We all wear that banner. It's not something to be ashamed of either at the same point because we all in, are in the same boat. Now, for those that are followers of Jesus Christ, there's that word that follows right in front that starts with an R. We are redeemed sinners. We are forgiven. We have been washed and clean. It doesn't mean that we don't sin anymore once we're baptized. It doesn't mean that we don't sin anymore uh, just because we go to church or we say, I believe in Jesus Christ. No, no, no. We still do sin. It's that's We struggle with sin. We have to confess our sins daily. But the reality is also is our faith is, is there's no, it's not a one-time event. It's not a past event that, a, you know, I was baptized. No, no, you are baptized. It's a, it's a constant, current, ongoing event in your life. You are baptized. You are baptized. It's not something in the past, but it goes with today. It goes with you. It doesn't just stop uh, because you reach some special point. The other side is is we don't choose Jesus, right? Um, it's not a choice that we made in our life, so I chose to come to Jesus. No, 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 no. God chose you. God chose you. And that's the, that's the thing that we need to remember in our life, in our living, that God is the chooser. He's the one that has made that selection 
we are passive in that. And that's, I, I don't know that I could emphasize that enough. I'm going to go back to the screen here because there's some biblical context we can go here uh, on the worksheet. The word disciple means student or apprentice, one who learns. Jesus called many people to follow him as disciples. Among the men and women who accompanied him in his travels, the disciples who were the closest to him were known as the Twelve. Much of Jesus' early ministry took place in the region of Galilee, on the northern end of the Holy Land. This was where he encountered Matthew, called Levi, in Mark and Luke. Tax collectors in those days were considered traitors to their own people, since they collected money on behalf of the occupying Romans. Tax collectors were notorious for overcharging, taking extra money for themselves. In the Gospels, they are used as examples of those considered to be sinners. They were the ones that were looked down upon by society. One is they were a traitor in the eyes of their people simply because they were doing the work for the occupiers, the Rome, because uh, on that is, and we do cover that in these questions. And I'll tell you, these questions are not that real thought provoking in my opinion. Uh, there's some things to think about in there uh, as we go, such as, do you know of anyone who goes by a name other than their proper name? One thing, one thing you'll notice in scriptures a lot is, is you'll find that there are people that have different names. Simon Peter, you know, he was given the name Peter or Cephas by Jesus, by God. Uh, and Peter or Cephas means rock. Uh, that's why we call him the rock or rock of our salvation on there. That's where uh, in Rome, that's why they believe uh, that Peter is buried where the Roman Basilica is, St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, and uh, that, and he is the um, uh, first bishop of the Roman Catholic Church, um, and that, and they, they that they would uh, argue that it doesn't really matter on that matter if he is or isn't buried there. Uh, he was one of the. He was obviously Peter was one of the leaders. Uh, Jesus said, "On you I will build my church." Uh, I think speaking more of on those like him are his disciples, those, the 12 that were there, um, that he was working through in their witness. Peter was by no means a perfect witness. He denied Jesus, right? Uh, three times. And, uh, even after saying he wouldn't, um, so there were some, but he was, there were some issues with Peter, but he was also Jesus's best friend. Uh, that's where we look in Mark, uh, two, uh, verses, uh, 13 to 14. This is one of those examples where we see uh, that difference in the name. I'm going to open up my Logos on there, and we are going to look at uh, some of the differences here. I have the mark in here. Actually, uh, hold on. I just had it, but uh, it is gone now. Oh, here it is. Mark 2. Uh, and we have verses 13 and 14 is what they recommended on the worksheet. And it goes, he went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now we don't know, uh, you know, some of the great questions on there is why was he Levi? Why was that choice? Was he... Um, he might have been uh, of the ancestry, Levitical priests, uh, didn't, and he might not have been one that was chosen to serve at the temple, um, basically because those that were of the tribes of Levi, Levi didn't have the same inheritance of every other tribe, uh, and that maybe not necessarily was well practiced at this time either, where the Levites, all Levite priests were being cared for. Um, so there's a good chance he may not have had uh, a regular means. So why did he become a tax collector? Is some of the, one of the questions, and it may have been he had no better job to do. Uh, he didn't have the skills. He wasn't a carpenter. He wasn't a craftsman. He wasn't uh, a worker in metal. Um, uh, a, uh, uh, he didn't. Uh, he, you know, he wasn't a farmer. He didn't do. Uh, he was. He didn't do shepherding. He, so there was many things he probably, he may not have worked on. He couldn't, he might not have been a mill, millwright or anything of that. So here we have him as a tax collector. 
looked down by the world at the time uh, because tax collectors were like the lowliest of the low. And uh, so Levi could be tied to his family name. Um, it could, you know, we don't, it doesn't really clarify why sometimes he's known as Levi and sometimes he's not, or he's known as Mark. Um, but th that really isn't the main point that we're looking at, right? Um, what we want to know is, uh, focusing on how God has changed lives and hearts. Um, but the question is there. Uh, what is the tax collector called in these verses? Do you think this is the same man? Uh, we would say through our studies and things like that, yes, uh, they, he's traditionally considered to be the same. Uh, so to uh, so there's not much disagreement on that. Or Matthew is also known as Levi. Um, now, as we went through here, I'm going to put this up again, is what did Matthew do for a living? We know we spoke about he's a tax collector in general. Uh, do people like to pay taxes, do you think? Uh, you know, one of the, I don't know of anybody that joyously pays their taxes, uh, but it is a duty. It is a contract we make with our, our municipalities in our country. Uh, we, we, we pay our taxes for the services that we receive. For example, if you have a, your road maintained, you have sewer, you have electricity, uh, you have uh, police or sheriff, you have fire care departments, all the uh, ambulance services, all these are, are part of the community and that's part of that contract we make. We want those services, we want to make sure, and schools and the like, we want to make sure that we do our part. Uh, and that's part of what paying taxes is. Now, I don't know of anybody that wants to wants to pay taxes, but we are called to pay taxes. The second part there, it says, to what conquering empire were these taxes going? We know it was Rome. And how do people, do you think people felt about Matthew? Well, we did talk about that. I did. Uh, he's a traitor. He's looked down upon. He's a sinner. Uh, we don't know how much, if he took an extra cut for himself. I mean, there was a portion out of the taxes that did have to come go to uh, the tax collectors, and they and and I think the expectation was of Rome that they uh, take. Rome said, "This is the portion that I must re that we receive per per person per head, uh, and you can collect whatever you like above that, and whatever you collect above that is yours to keep." Uh, so there may have been some that had a larger percentage and wanted to live a better life. And there were some that just wanted to make sure they could take care of their family and put food on their table and the like. Um, but most people did not care for tax collectors. I don't know too many people that care for tax collectors here, uh, you know, even in our time in the United States. Nobody likes to get a letter or a phone call from the IRS, uh, especially one that says you're under audit. Uh, nobody likes to be audited, um, but uh, you know. The, so, but but we know it's necessary. But we also don't, don't necessarily like these. So, not only were they doing something that people, these tax collectors, doing something that most people don't think as being a popular thing to do. Nobody wants to pay those taxes, hand over that tax money. But also, this is a conquering nation, so they're paying tribute to a invader. And the invader would say, this is to cover these things. Uh, you know, you need to pay my troops and for that protection. But at the same time, they weren't able to raise up their own army or anything of that nature to protect themselves. So they were fully dependent upon Rome to uh, protect them from any foreign invaders or anybody that do harm. So when Jesus called Matthew, uh, and this is the third question here, to follow him, what was he asking? And what does it mean for us to follow Jesus in our own lives? Well, for us to follow Jesus is is a is is a different sacrifice than what others would face. Uh, in in some ways, I, you can't not not fully. It's, I mean. We, uh, we, we, we don't have to leave our jobs that we currently hold to follow Jesus for the most part. Now, as if you're called to be a pastor, that's a little different, but not everybody's called to be a pastor. Um, for the majority of Christians, 
Uh, you are called to serve God in the vocation that you are currently working. Um, so whatever that may be, if that's where God wants you to be, that's where your ministry field begins. That's your, that's your ministry field, personal. Um, but at the time for the disciples and like pastors, what does it mean to follow Jesus in our own lives? Um, uh, it, it's a matter of giving up the things that you may um, want to do or desire to do uh, and taking on a new calling, a new way of life, living. Because uh, they all had to give up everything um, to be able to do this. They had to leave their families behind. Uh, it wasn't like they had vacation time they could take off or, you know, and they, they'd go for a week here and a week there. Um, they pretty much, they walked with Jesus for three years, uh, teaching and preaching. So, and they were dependent on the little means that they would be able to find when they were out and about. I'm sure people offered them gifts and things like that. And they received food. Uh, they received offerings. Uh, we know Judas Iscariot kept the money bag, so that means they had some sources of income while they were while they were moving around to be able to maintain themselves. But they gave up no, their normal living. They didn't do and work like they normally would. Uh, for us, following Jesus, uh, for the most, it's a matter of how do you uh, making sure that in your work you are reflecting Him in how you speak to your coworkers, how you speak to clients or customers, how you speak with. Uh, your bosses, uh, all of those things are guided by our faith. And even and even how we do, do, do our work, it's meant to glorify God. So um, doing everything to the best of your ability is honestly God-honoring. That's what, that, that's what we're expected to do as followers of Christ. We should be the best employees of any place that we work, where every Christian should, I mean, Christians should be sought after by employers. Uh, you know, I mean, honestly, think about that. We can't do that in our society today um, because of restrictions and things like that, uh, possible discrimination mentality. But, you know, if imagine if on your application is you are, are you a follower of Christ? And if that were being one, uh, and saying that was something you wanted as an employee, so you sought after it. Not saying you wouldn't hire someone else, but if you could hire, if every person you hired was a follower of Christ, a true follower, uh, and worked to do their work to glorify God, um, we would be sought after. And honestly, there would be probably bosses that would be, even if they didn't ask the question directly, would be looking how you walked and carried yourself, if you wore a cross, maybe, but that, that you could just buy a cross um, and not truly be a follower. Um, so it would be a matter of listening for certain cues on how they talk and how we talk. And that's something really to think about in our lives is how, how do we sound? Um, if somebody were to listen to us or watch our life, would they know that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Or would they see no difference from anybody else in the world? Uh, and that's, um, I mean, honestly, that's a, a good thing to think about as we walk out in faith and we walk out our faith. I'm going to go back to the screen here with the questions here. The Pharisees were good people. That's true. But they thought they were better than everyone else. It's also true. What was Jesus doing in the story that they didn't like? And why did they think this was wrong? Well, Jesus was eating with the sinners of that age, and you don't want to, people you would not want to associate yourself with uh, in good company. And Jesus did this a lot. But, you know, we have to realize that as Christians, if they're not, as long as we're not allowing them to influence our way of living, there's nothing wrong with hanging around people or being around people that are not believers. In fact, we need to be around people that aren't believers in our life. We need to work and, and be able to witness and find ways to be able to reach out and talk to those that are not a part of the Christian faith. Uh, that's just a normal, normal process. It's a set standard of how we should operate as people of God. Um, and uh, sometimes I think we forget that. Um, that uh, uh, we, we, we 
need to hang around good Christians all the time. And, you know, cause we don't want to, especially as parents, it's, you know, it's not like I want my children hanging around uh, bad influences, but ultimately our goal as parents and our goal as people is we are to be the ones influencing and not be influenced. Unfortunately, that tends to be a reverse, uh, cause it all depends because our thinking is still sinful. We're still broken. Uh, so we want to be careful and thoughtful of how and who and how we witness to others and how we don't allow others to influence us um, to be able to draw us away. Um, but uh, they, but so often, even if you think in our world, how often do we look down upon people because they aren't like us? or people that hang around people that aren't like us. That's something really that is the church. Jesus was modeling that we shouldn't do that. Uh, the next uh, question on there is, what does a doctor do for sick people? And what was Jesus' reason for spending time with sinners? What did he want to do for them? Well, we know uh, it's important to go for healing, uh, as was shared, though. You know, some, you know doctors... Uh, you know, it says you should go even when, you know, you only go when you're sick. Uh, doctors say, oh, no, 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 you need your well care visits. We need to check you when you're healthy, too. And if you don't know something's wrong, we want to make sure. And uh, they'd be criticizing this as uh, something that we, you know, we only, if we only go when we're sick, then we're not doing the right thing. Um, preventative care, preventative care. Um, well, that wasn't something that would have been common at that time anyway. If you only go to a doctor when you're sick, uh, that mentality uh, has been the main mentality throughout most of the time we know. Uh, it's not until actually very recent time that we find people going to the doctors just to make sure and do well checks. You know, make sure you're healthy now when you have a baby and all that. That's normal. But as adults, it's not often as common unless you have to have regular testing because you have other disease or something in your life breaking down um, and that's uh, that's a sign of uh, our bodies but you know really um, if we if we're honest on that is uh, we really mainly go to the doctor when we're ill um, and uh, that's their point is I mean when we have issues in our life we go I mean I know I didn't. I I, I know uh, if I didn't have asthma or other things, I probably wouldn't have gone to a doctor's as much as I did when I was younger, uh, and I probably wouldn't go as often now. Uh, but you know that's just a reality uh, because there is something uh, you know those of uh, those who have health health things that uh, need to have medicines regularly. Uh, that's very common, you know, going to be checked to make sure everything's doing okay. And, uh, and it's good to do. But reality is, is if you are sinless, you don't need Jesus. Uh, and Jesus came to be with those who realize their sin. And he wanted to heal them of their sin, just like doctors want to make us better, make us feel better, uh, free us from those bondages of illness and shame and sickness. Uh, and we continue on as Jesus said he'd come to call sinners. Are, are you a sinner? What does that mean? Where did you? What did Jesus come to do for you? And that's the sixth question we read over here. Um, so um, if you're reading that, uh, so Jesus said that he came to call sinners. This is a good question to ponder. And I want to let you know, I mean, everybody is a sinner. You're a sinner. If you don't realize it, I'm sorry, it's true. <laughs> uh, you can't be a Christian unless you're a sinner. Uh, that's uh, There are no uh, sinless Christians. There's redeemed sinners in every Christian church. Uh, and you and like your baptism isn't a one-time event. You walk in your waters of baptism. Sin doesn't just disappear because you make a decision to follow Jesus, and you make a decision to go to church. You hear the problem of both of those those sentences I said. You make a decision to follow Jesus. You make a decision to go to church. That's all about you. It's not about God. It's not about salvation. It's all about you. 
And uh, we don't redeem our own sin. Jesus does. We go to church because we're called by our Lord to go to church. It's something that's placed in your heart that your heart should ache and yearn to hear the word of God preached. And that's, uh, but we know that that doesn't always happen. That's part of being uh, in a fallen and broken world. Now the seventh question, it says, read Romans 5 verses 1 through 11. So I'm going to go to the Logos here. And I'm going to pull that up. And here we go. And it is over here. I'm going to highlight this. And I am going to put that in blue. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, and more shall, be, shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we, while we were still, while, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. All right. As we look at the questions in the worksheet on that, those verses, uh, let's uh, we see. According to these verses, did Jesus come to give His life for us because we deserve to be saved? What words are used in the verses to describe human beings in our relationship with God? How did Jesus respond? Well. When we think about our relationship and we think about what God is doing in our lives, the greatest question that we have to ask and the greatest words that are put out there uh, by Paul is that we are suffering. We suffer in faith, right? Suffering is a part of our world. If you, if you have a life that's charmed and you never know suffering, oh, God bless you. But I don't know that there are people that don't. Now, I know a lot of people that don't do well in suffering. Uh, and they cry out and they cry against God because of suffering. But see, suffering is natural. It's a natural part of our world. It's part of the fallen creation. It points to us to the reality that the things of this world are not right. But they will be once, uh, they will be restored. In that, when we see the suffering, it points us to Christ in the cross. And we can find hope knowing that Christ died on the cross. He suffered on the cross for us and our sins. And we don't have to sit and worry or wonder about, have I lived a good enough life? Am I, uh, am I going to receive heaven? Am I going to be restored? Am I going? Have I done enough? Well, you know, you will never know when you've done if you've ever done enough because you never do enough. We're never we're never doing enough. Our faith is never done because it's an ongoing process, just like our baptism, just like our redemption. It's ongoing. The same is true about what God is doing in our lives 
and how we are in need of him, how we're being reconciled to him. We are being changed by him. And that's, that's simply where it stands. We, it, there are many who struggle with that reality. And I, I think we need to because it's, it's not something we do naturally. It's not something of who we are. The final question for the group that we have was, in what way is forgiveness of sins at the heart of the gospel message of Jesus? And what would our fate be if Jesus had not forgiven our sins? Well, this is a really tough one. In what way is the forgiveness of sin at the heart of the gospel message of Jesus? It's tough in the sense of realizing that, yes, we are sinners in need of a Savior. If he didn't die, there'd be no hope. What would our fate be if Jesus had not forgiven our sins? There'd be no hope. We would be on our own. We would be hungering for something more. And and quite honestly, there are many in this world that do not know Jesus died for their sins. And they're hungering for so much more. They're yearning something. See, in Jesus, we have been given everything. Now, the Romans 5, 1 through 11 points us to the core of our of Luther and the theology of the justification by faith alone. Um, you know, trying to justify ourselves by our works. It's a, and we know there are churches that do that. Everybody loves, there are those that love to point at the Roman Catholic Church and indulgences and the doing of penance and having to go to the, talk to the priest and the priest gives a, the, the penance that's due uh, saying certain prayers, doing certain things, giving certain amounts of money, all of those things, all this work. When do you know it's enough? Well, when the priest says it's enough. When does the priest say it's enough? Honestly, a priest will never say it's enough. Because every day you're going to be found, you, you live, you're going to be found guilty of something. Um, you're going to say, you're going to think, you're going to do. We are sinful. We are broken. We are fallen. But the reality is our salvation is not ours to work on. It's given to us because of our God. Plain and simple. And Jesus accepted a tax collector and fisherman. He even had a, a thief on his, uh, on his disciples in Judas Iscariot. That thief actually carried the money bags. No, but God still used them. And God still uses us, even when we're imperfect, even when we don't make the right choices, even when we say the wrong things. Uh, I mean, when a message pierces our heart and our spirit, Don't blame the message. Pray. See where the Holy Spirit's leading you. It's easy to become offended. Really it is. We live in a world that lives with far too much offense. So easily. Offense is a choice. But when we look inward... We can see the offense of God on us in our sin. We repent and we're forgiven. We don't have to do penance. We don't have to pray any special prayers. We just say, Father, forgive me. And he takes it away. Mark, uh, when Matthew is being called as, uh, uh, when Matthew is being called to be a disciple, he realized in himself something was different about this man Jesus he saw. And it was something so different that to him it was valuable in giving everything up. And the same is true. The same is true for each and every one of us. When we hear God calling, and he's calling us away. He's asking us to give up the things in this world that we think are valuable. 
so we can receive the fullness of what truly is valuable. Oh, there's so much that we could discuss more on this, and there are things that were discussed in the class um, that didn't always relate, never always does. It doesn't, there's always other issues that do arise, and we have to be aware of that in there in the class, and it's good to have that opportunity. I think it's, I love to have discussion. I love to have other ideas. Sometimes I have to rein it in. Uh, sometimes, sometimes I have to check my own bias too and say, okay, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, we need to think there are others that might think differently uh, than what I agree with. Um, and that, that happens often. And uh, it's, it's nice to have that discussion though. Um, so when we are together and in the word, it's wonderful to be together. And uh, I'm glad to do this for those that aren't able to make uh, the classes. I hope that you find this to be filling and you, you, you have some ideas and it opens some things up. If you have questions, feel free to ask them, like I said earlier. And uh, always feel free to email me. Uh, if you need to call or text, you can also call or text. Uh, but I'm here for you. And we are glad to have you be a part of us in our studies. I hope you continue uh, growing in your faith. And I hope you continue to be drawn closer and closer to the cross of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful day. God's peace be with you. Until next time.